a greenhouse effect, how the radiation balance works. We know that if these change, the expectation is, and it's not expectation, it's measurable, this part of the energy balance changes. We look in the past, we know that there's dynamic variability in the system, we know that there's been changes in these two elements, including a change in temperature. So clearly, one is related to the other, and that change in radiation balance is, is um, realizing itself in a change in, in planetary temperature change based on a, re a radiation balance. Um, how do we know that things are unusual? Well, we have really interesting science that's um, done by paleoclimatologists that drill into um, sea ice and can go back down miles and pull out miles of cores of sea ice and look at the climate back over the last half million years based on every year little um, bubbles of gas being locked in the ice every year going back half a million years. We know exactly what the concentration of the atmosphere's gases were in that particular year. We can do this all over the world. Amazing, amazing stuff. We're able to look at the world in ways we've never been able to look at it before. But this is just a 10,000 year graph here. This is um, carbon dioxide changes over the last 10,000 years. Um, this is methane changes and this is nitrous oxide changes. And these little uh, numbers over here um, are what we call radiative forcing, and that's, that's just simply the amount of extra energy that it puts into the atmosphere based on the change in the concentration, right? So positive numbers in radiative forcing indicate an additional warming, downward warming component to the atmosphere. Okay, can it, just another line of time series here, um, CO2 concentrations. This is a global temperature and carbon dioxide. Again, this is not enough. It's um, just correlative at this point, but again, if you put it together with past changes, or understanding of the radiation balance and the expectation if you change those greenhouse gases, you'd see a temperature change, and then you plot them together, that then gives you more of uh, evidence that the system is uh, behaving based on your conceptual model correctly. Um, and then we can look at more observational evidence of how things have changed spatially. Um, this is the average changes across the U.S. from, uh, this is the present day versus the baseline. So. Uh, meaning this period is warmer, um, all these yellow colors warmer than the period of 1961, 1979. And it's kind of modeled across the U.S., but if you notice here, the Southwest is very clearly warmer now than it was, and we see that pretty consistent across the record. Um, again, precipitation, if you remember, is not trendy, and I mean that in, many, I guess, a couple different ways. It doesn't have long-term trend. It has variability that varies on decades. Okay, and that's driven again by El Nino and Southern Oscillation. So you see really strange patterns across the U.S. because there isn't really any place that's getting consistently dry or consistently wet over a long period of time. It's just bobbing all over the place. The, south, the southeast has been interesting. It's gone from being very wet to very dry to very dry, no, wet, dry. It's dry again, it was wet, okay? And it's, it's gone that back and forth. We've done the same, okay? The Pacific Northwest has done the same. Uh, the Northeast is actually interesting. It's getting wetter, 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 and wetter. They're seeing more and more extreme events, which if you really back up, you could see why, based on extra energy in the atmosphere. Um, another way of looking at this data and carving it up is to look at the amount of snow versus rain that's accumulated in the historical record across the West. Um, this, these little circles are at places that have now, um, between 1949 and 2004, they're observing more um, rain observations during the winter time than snow observations during the winter time. Okay, so that is another. Th so if precip is kind of bobbing back and forth, but it's getting warmer, you'd expect to see snow levels changing on, again, on average. Any given year is going to be um, hanging out by itself. So climate is not about any given year. Climate's about a lot of data, long-term record. Um, this is important because you see a pretty clear signal across most of the West that most places are shifting toward towards more rain. What is the biggest reservoir system in the United States? It's not dams, it's snowpack, right? We are geared up and designed to manage snowpack in the western U.S. If climate doesn't cooperate in maintaining snowpack, we don't have a backup. We don't have a backup plan for that part of it. Okay, and then this idea of vegetation change, um, this is, uh, again, kind of a complicated graphic, but I just want to orient you to these two stripes here, and these are uh, a series of researchers, um, many in Arizona, New Mexico, um, agency scientists, talking about the pinyon juniper die-off that occurred across Arizona, primarily with the 2002 drought, uh, was looking at and comparing the 1950s drought 
uh, to the more recent drought. And the point of this figure in particular is that the more recent drought was actually warmer than the past drought, but not quite as dry. So again, going back to that idea that the 50s drought was cooler but drier, the more recent drought was warmer but wetter, they have equivalent impacts because higher amounts of evapotranspiration in a warmer climate drive more arid conditions. And again, I think that the, the biggest issue for the Southwest in particular is it's really going to, the biggest impact of warming temperatures is going to be on vegetation. And it's going to be on trees as the first, the first line of um, impacts. And we're already seeing it, which was part of this, the, the point of this study done even seven years ago. Okay, so climate change modeling and projections. I don't want to spend any time on that. I want to just look at this particular graph. And again, this idea of its weight of evidence, lots of different threads. This is another really important way to do climate science. And it's, it's um, we're looking at paleo um, historic time series to try to look at the context of the current to the past, how unusual is the past, how unusual is the present to the past. We try to look at um, spatial patterns, but we also use climate models um, as a really important part to try to understand um, how the system works, okay? And so, questions? Lost my, oh, the mic? Anybody hear me? No? Not on, okay. Should I speak louder? Can I speak just louder or? Okay. Okay, we got right to the top, right to the top, right. <laughs> Okay, great. Oh, it's a battery. Uh, battery issue. Okay. Should I wait? Okay. So we do this exer exercise to try to fit how things, how to figure out how things fit together. You build models, right? That's one of the ways that we do science, in particular. The scientific method, historically, though, is an experimental process where you have um, a control in a manipulation, right? And I think a lot of people think of climate science or dismiss climate science because we don't have that. For climate science to work in the way that we, whoop, giving away my, my punchline here, is we don't have an experimental planet to run a control on, okay? We can't do science in the same way as you do in a chemistry experiment or an, an ecological experiment or a a physics experiment. We don't have a control, right? So we build models to create control situations. And again, the models have to be, the models are as good as how they're built, um, but the models then try to put together all the fundamental pieces of the climate to then capture, and then you run them in the past and see how well they actually got the situation right. Then you run it into the future to use as a, as a guidance tool. Again, not really for predicting the future, but as a tool to guide decision making. But so as a climate science um, perspective here, this is uh, an experiment you can run with a climate model. And it doesn't have to be a very sophisticated one, actually. But if you look at the last 100 years of data where we have really good uh, uh, instrumental data, you can look at the observational data, which is this black line. And then you build two models. You build one model where the radiation balance is only driven by natural variability, which is um, solar variability, the sun's output um, changing slightly over time, and volcanic eruptions punctuating the climate signal by putting up lots of what we call small aerosol, small particles that shade out the planet and cause it to cool um, as one model. And then you do that, but then you add in these greenhouse gas uh, emissions on top of it. Okay, so if we run that model, this is again, a black line is observational. The natural model is that blue line here. And you can see here through most of the um, last century, they, everybody tracks together pretty well. But we get to about the mid-60s here and we have a divergence. The observations are here. The model without greenhouse gas changes is here. The model with greenhouse gas changes is here. Again, so the model here tells us to get the story right with observational data, we have to have that extra radiative component in the atmosphere to actually model the climate system correctly. Right? So again, this is weight of evidence, right? No single thing is deterministic on its own. It's about using all this information together to put together a story about how we think things work and where we think things are going. So if you use this, use this information from a projection standpoint, we can do things like 
tweak these parameters and then run them for 100 years into the future. So if we, we change the greenhouse gas emissions to um, a lower scenario, meaning that they sort of taper off or they level out, you get this much warming across the U.S., which is about two degrees Fahrenheit on average by mid-century. By late century, the interior part of the country is up around five degrees warmer on average over the annual cycle. This pattern here, if you remember back to your geography class, is a continental pattern. So places that are away from oceans can warm up faster, and they also cool down faster. So they're under the influence of um, continentality, what we call, more heavily. Under higher emission scenario, you get more warming. So everybody is now, by mid-century, four degrees Fahrenheit, and then by late century, we're up to eight to 10 degrees Fahrenheit above average warmer, right? And so that's climate, right? So your annual signal is still gonna be punctuated by freezing events and snow, but your hottest days are hotter, and on average, most of your days are warmer than they were before. Cli weather is still weather, climate is still climate. Okay, precipitation projections become kind of interesting too, and this is a real argument in this climate science community, we're still sorting out. Models don't do very good with precipitation because precip is really, really hard to model. But on average, what you're finding in the models is what they are agreeing upon is that there's this expectation that the winter, okay, so you can see here, this is wintertime jet stream weather system. So the jet stream is whipping across the US. It's what you're looking for when you're looking at your weather in the wintertime. It starts to park itself further north in the winter and spring and makes less, um, um, it, it visits the southwest less in the wintertime because the jet stream is lifted north following the cold air in the planet. That's what drives the jet stream. The summer is a complete toss up. We have no idea how the summer is gonna change into the future because the monsoon is so complicated going forward. And the same with fall. Um, you know, errant tropical storms, we don't see them two weeks ahead of time. We, won't, we just don't have any idea how that'll change into the future. Again, but that's not a good way to plan on, right, on these, these really high uh, episodic uh, transient events. Okay, so I'm wrapping up here. Um, pretend, these, again, I, we don't have the, um, the real fine scale data for these again. And again, these are, these are not to tell you exactly what's gonna happen. It's just to give you an indication of what the models are suggesting as far as changes based on emission trajectories. Um, these colors right here, are the change in frost days across the globe, and red means less, right? So everybody who has frost days gets less of them, right? Doesn't mean they go away completely, just means they get to be less. Um, that's what these lines are indicating. This is below, it means less. Um, this means more heat waves. You can see this little bullseye across the southwest here, an indica indication of many more extreme heat wave events, which is how we actually get to our our increase in temperature here, so those really hot punctuated events. And then um, growing seasons actually do get longer in many locations too, which is a potential um, positive if you can take advantage of the situation if you have the water to actually grow something. Um, changes in precipitation are a little over the map, but what we're seeing is a really robust, um, the models are consistently telling us that they expect extreme events to get more extreme is that the atmosphere just gets more and more energized and is able to make stronger storms. Stronger storms are able to put down more extreme events. And that's where the, the trend in precipitation in the Northeast United States seems to be really consistent with that. They've had many more 100-year flooding events in the last 10 years than they had in the last 100 years. Um, so you see this uh, ramp up in uh, precipitation intensity globally, much higher latitudes. We're kind of at a wash right here, but still above. And again, it's because they don't get the monsoon right. If they got the monsoon right, that would actually change. And then the number of dry days, this is the drought signal sort of emerging across the middle bands of the planet. Okay, and again, I already made this point earlier, but warmer conditions, even under the same amount of precipitation, indicate drier conditions. Um, and this is especially uh, important to um, sort of shallow, so shallow soil water resources that plants uh, take part in, and primarily trees. I think trees, again, I think trees are really in trouble across the West um, based on this drying condition. Um, so we don't need to have the precip um, projection really nailed to know that warming conditions will cause impacts on their own, especially in marginal climates like Arizona, and I mean that in the kindest, nicest way, um, that it's, it's, uh, you know, it's a tough, tough place to make go in. 
warmer conditions don't, don't really help that, help that along too much. Um, this doesn't really tell you anything new. It's just basically you can fit a trend line. You see drier conditions across the um, upper and lower basin soil moisture-wise. And so I'll just finish here with implications. Again, higher temperatures, higher evaporation and transpiration rates, um, inducing more of a water loss, um, less snow, more rain in winter. Uh, on average, again, climatologically, we have, we're going to continue to have freeze events like we had in February. It will continue to snow. Um, it's just how and where that water gets uh, moved around. Is, that's the real complicated thing that I can't tell you, and I'm not a hydrologist, and that's where this becomes a really interdisciplinary problem is it's probably not as simple as, as um, portraying it from the, um, once it hits the ground, I lose control of it, right? I'm a climatologist, right? Where it goes after that, you guys have to sort of argue that out. Um, but these higher temperatures do have implications on how much of that actually gets put into the system. Precip lower confidence, higher temperatures, increasing variability, more flooding, and intervening drought periods. And just leave you with a couple of um, projects that I'm working on. Uh, Southwest Climate Change Network has a lot of this information I presented today. It's part of the climate assessment for the Southwest that I work with. And I'm also part of an uh, e-extension community of practice on forests and climate. And thanks. Thanks very much. It was really fun talking with you.